So, um, it may be that for some of you this is uh, the first time you've been to uh, Mapa. How many people first time to Mapa? Okay. And maybe for some of you this is your first Adizan blessing. How many people first time? Oh, okay. So, uh, this is one of the uh, major. Uh, days of the Buddhist calendar, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the story of Dizang, or Kitigarbha, uh, in Sanskrit, Dizang in Chinese. Of course, Chinese is tonal, right? So every uh, syllable has a tone. So these on uh, fourth tone for both, so it's like going down. So if, if we say the wrong tone, if the person doesn't understand us, we might be saying something completely different. These on. So this uh, holiday ceremony blessing is. Uh, about uh, the experience that we all have in common. This experience is the letting go of this physical body. So each one of us, we get our physical body when we're born or conceived, and then we have this physical body for a while and then we all have to learn how to let go of this physical body. These so, on is the, the means our earth store. We were experiencing as we stood the energy of the earth. This physical body, this solid form that we have, so this earth store is the result, as we know, from even science. They didn't have the scientific terminology in the time of uh, when Bizon first was uh, a figure in the world. They didn't know about this, but they talked about how um, there were seeds now we know we have uh, DNA, kind of a seed. And so this seed is uh, what it is that our form body is the result of. So in addition to the form body that we have, we have uh, feelings, thoughts, we have habit energy and consciousness, all of those things are the result of different kinds of seeds. And uh, these seeds are stored. So when a person comes into the world, their seed energy is manifested in this body. And when a person leaves, their seed energy dissipates from this body. So Dizan is the figure who maintains the protection of the seeds. So when we go to the Dizan Hall, you see uh, a statue of the depiction of that mind state. He's sitting, he's holding a staff. So the staff has uh, several different functions. He, when the, he walks, he bangs the staff on the ground and all the creatures, all the insects, they can move away so he doesn't step on them. Also, the staff can be used to hold open the gates so that people do not get stuck in the realm of the mind that is most painful, where the greatest suffering takes place. And so uh, we might translate this as a, a hell realm. So when the mind goes into that realm, 
lots and lots of disturbance. So we don't want people, no matter what, to be to remain there. We want them to be able to eventually become bodhisattvas and Buddhas. So this realm needs to remain open so that people are able to have their seeds nurtured in a wholesome way. So the story of uh, that uh, they're chanting in the Dizong Hall is uh, the story of Dizong and how he became a monk. So Dizong is one of the four great bodhisattvas. And he's the only one who's a monk. All the rest are lay people. Avalokiteshvara or Guanyin, we have the Guanyin pavilion, represents compassion. Manjushri, Guanchu, represents wisdom. Soon we will have a wisdom hall in the new female dormitory. And a statue of uh, Manjushri. So Mantabhavra, who is Sien Pusa, Pusa Bodhisattva. So Mantra Baba is the meditation Bodhisattva, representing how the primary Buddha have always maintained a state of peacefulness in their mind and have practiced what are called the Ten Vows, the Ten Great Vows, to become a Bodhisattva. And then the fourth is uh, Kiti Garba, Dizan. This is the vow to liberate all beings from the hell realms. So his famous vow, as recited by many Buddhists, goes like this, the translation, not until the hells are emptied will I become a Buddha. Not until all beings are saved will I certify to Bodhi. So the Bodhisattva renounces becoming a Buddha or entering in the highest realm of being a Bodhi, uh, of the Bodhi awakened mind until all other beings have also attained this. So what they're chanting uh, is the uh, Dizang Sutra, and it is uh, divided into 13 different parts of chapters. And the original one was uh, found uh, at uh, Dong Huang, which is a very famous excavation site with, uh, on the side of a mountain that has many caves in uh, northwestern China, and it was discovered probably around the 9th century. And the story that talks about a, a monk and uh, describes this uh, experience of how this transformation took place. So it's described in the sutra. Uh, it said that it was uh, spoken by the Buddha towards the end of his life uh, to uh, be uh, something that would be remembered and be helpful to all beings. It was uh, part of the teaching that the Buddha gave uh, as a remembrance to his mother, Mahadevi. The Buddha's mother passed away giving birth to him. And uh, she is a. So, in the cosmology, in Mahayana Buddhism, there, is, uh, these, there are these uh, places that uh, different mind states reside. And right above the mind state that we're in, right here, in the desire realm, just closely connected to that. Uh, are three different levels. Um, and the 
highest of those levels is called Triatrimstra, uh, where 33 devas live. Devas are beings that don't have a physical body, but are there to kind of help us along, most of them. Protecting the devas are four great kings that are a little bit lower in this mind state depiction that is on the mountain, now it's Sumeru, right below them, four great <coughs> kings who protect them. So, in the beginning of this uh, sutra, the monastics and the lay people will be chanting in Chinese, and this is how the sutra begins. Thus have I heard, once the Buddha was abiding in Trimsha, at this higher realm, in order to expound the Dharma to his mother. At that time, all the Buddhas and great Bodhisattva and Mahasattvas, and inexpressible number, hailing from countless worlds in the ten directions, came and ascended there. And they praised the fact that the Buddha, Shakyamuni, in evil times with the five kinds of defilements, was still able to manifest his inconceivable power of great wisdom and miracles in order to regulate and tame the stubborn beings so that they could come to no suffering and to take the light and the dharma. Each of them sent his attendant to greet the world honored one. So this is the beginning of the story. So uh, around the eighth paragraph, there is this beginning of the, in the first chapter, there is this uh, new uh, character who is introduced to us, and her name is Sacred Girl. She had a mother who was very much against the Buddha and the Buddha's teaching, and she would often say many negative things about the Buddha and about his teachings and about even the, the goodness of, of people, etc. He was a very uh, angry person. And when Sacred Girl's mother passed away. She knew that her mother's consciousness had entered into one of the hell realms, and she was very concerned about this, and she did not want her mother to suffer there. Uh, so she decided that she would dedicate her life to trying to exchange places with her mother. So she would dedicate all of her merit to her mother, and her mother would be free from the hell realms, even if it meant that she herself would end up in the hell realm. So the sutra continues. At that time, this holy girl, sacred girl, tried many expediences to persuade her mother before she passed to adopt her refuse, but her mother was not thoroughly convinced and soon after the mother passed away and her seed energy fell into the uninterrupted hell. And the sacred girl knew that her mother, not believing in the law of causation, would inevitably be reborn into an evil existence according to her karma. So, the sacred girl sold all of her possessions and bought vast amounts of incense and flowers and other offerings to be generously donated to the stupas and to the temples of the Buddha of that era. So as the story continues, one day at the temple while she was pleading for help, she heard the voice of the Buddha advising her to go home and immediately immediately and there sit down and recite his name if she wanted to know where her mother was and she did as she was told and while she was there her consciousness was transported to this hell realm where she met 
a guardian who informed her that through her fervent prayers and pious offerings, her mother had accumulated much merit, and therefore she had already been released from the hell realm and ascended to the higher realm. So in the sutra it says, she saw in the temple the image of the enlightenment flower, serenity, self, sovereignty, king, Tathagata. This is the person that she met. And the Brahma girl, sacred girl, played obeisance. And showing extra reverence, she held deep in her heart the following thought. The Buddha is the great enlightened one, possessing all kinds of wisdom. If he were in this world, he would be able to tell me of my mother's whereabouts after her death. And she wept for quite a long time while she was gazing at the Tathagata. And suddenly she heard a voice from the midair saying, Oh, weeping girl, do not be so too sorrowful, for I shall now reveal to you your mother's whereabouts. And the sacred girl with prongs joined pointed directly to the midair, saying, May I know who the sacred and virtuous one who is, who relieves my worry? Since I lost my mother, I think about her day and night but there has been no one I could ask to tell me of her whereabouts. And the voice from the midair responded to the girl again, I am the one you are saying your prayers to, the enlightenment flower, serenity, self-sovereignty, king, tatagata, seeing that you remembered and cherished your mother much more than in ordinary beings, I manifest to reveal her whereabouts to you. So she was greatly relieved that her mother was, was uh, able to leave the hell realm, but when she opened her eyes and she saw all the beings in the hell realm, it touched her tender heart so much that she wanted now to do her very best to relieve their suffering of all of the beings. And so this uh, dedication to be a benefit to all beings, this is uh, the vow that she made and she was then transformed into Isaac. So there is another legend that's kind of parallel to this one, not in the sutra, but another legend that is important one in uh, Mahayana Buddhism. And in this legend, uh, there is a, uh, a monk who uh, was traveling through China. He was a Korean monk. And he uh, ended up sitting at, this, you know, at a mountain. And when he was there, at this mountain, he was uh, bitten by a poisonous snake. But he didn't move, and a woman passing by gave him medicine and cured him of the venom. And he continued to meditate there for 75 years. Oh, but in the middle of all of this, a uh, scholar came by and offered to build him a temple and the monk said, uh, well, I don't need very much space. Uh, just make it as big as my sash. And he took his sash off. And the monk said, oh, this is going to be too small of a temple. And he threw the sash up in the air, and it covered the entire mountain. So the scholar built him a very beautiful <coughs> temple at the top of this mountain, and now this mountain, uh, Mount Chokwa, is Chokwa uh, Shan, is in uh, a place where people can visit. And the unique thing about this is, is that uh, his body, uh, when he passed away, did not decay and it's still sitting there. So if you go there, you can see his body still sitting there.
So this, uh, this is one of the four sacred mountains in China. So I don't know if you have been around people who have passed who are passing away. But one of the things that we can notice when a person nears death, it's very obvious whether they are conscious or unconscious, whether their mind is clear or drifts into unconsciousness. Another quality that we can see in the mind is whether or not the uh, mind is peaceful or whether it's disturbed. I don't know if any of you have been following the news. There is a, um, a woman who has been on, her family has been on the news, it's been in the newspaper, all over the news. Uh, a woman who was uh, bit by a mosquito has West Nile virus. Anybody notice? Very rare this would happen in St. Louis. And, uh, she is uh, at Missouri Baptist Hospital right near the moment of death. Very rare for a person to get West Nile and for it to make them that sick, but in this case, true. I, I know about this very uh, much in detail because she is our cousin. At the same time that she went into the hospital, my father-in-law fell and broke his rib, and he was on the same floor as her before she was transferred to ICU. So we had two people in the hospital at the same time. Her consciousness very subdued into dreamland. My father-in-law, his, at 89, his consciousness was not aware of where he was. His consciousness made up a story that where he was was at his old plumbing supply house and he didn't understand why there were all these people around him in the hospital totally disoriented. He didn't know who any of us were. This is called, uh, in psychotherapy terms, ICU psychosis. Very common, not, not so uncommon thing to happen. When he got out of the hospital, then he returned to his normal self. He has a, some degree of uh, memory trouble, but not nearly like this. So the mind, when it, it nears death, it can be, if we are fortunate to have practiced well, the mind is very clear and calm and not disturbed. And so we can generate the intention to be aware and awake. We think about how it is that we can still be a benefit until our last breath. If the practice has not been so strong at different levels of practice, then the mind either becomes unconscious or becomes so disturbed. So, This was almost 19 years ago. A Tibetan Lama, who I was studying with at the time, said to me, Don Shushu, it is time for you to prepare for death. I said, Lama, do you know something I don't know? He says, yes. What is it? You will die. I said, Lama, soon? He said, I'm a llama, not a fortune teller. <laughs> no one knows. But it's not too soon for you to practice. Begin to practice. I will help you. 
you will learn from me the nine point meditation on death. And you will practice it every night in a dark room without even a candle on. And then after you do this, you'll picture all the different ways you can die. And I thought, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I've told the story before, but it's a good story. So I'm sitting there in the cross-legged in the meditation room in my house, and I get sleepy, and I fall over, and I hit my elbow, and my shoulder, and my head, and I think, oh, Lama, he is so compassionate, he would not want me to hurt myself. So I very quietly went back to the bedroom, my wife sleeping and I sat cross-legged on the bed and I fell asleep and I fell on top of her. <laughs> and she said, what are you doing? I'm going to kill you. And I said, no, no, I haven't thought of that way of dying yet. <laughs> and she said, please go into the other room and take pillows and put them all around you so that when you fall over, you fall over on the pillows and not on me. <laughs> Sometimes the wife is mightier than the lama. Yeah. So I practiced this for three years. These are, the, these are the nine point meditation. For each point has a three part if it has the initial root saying, and then there are three reasons and then an aspiration. Four parts each one. So the root, the first one, is called the definite nature of death. When I say these to you, think to yourself, are there, is this true or not true? You can examine it yourself. The first reasoning of the three, everyone in the past has died. There is no way to extend life indefinitely. Much of what we do is transitory. And the aspiration, take up a spiritual path. Second root. The indefiniteness of the time of one's death. And the three reasonings. One, people die at all different ages. The second one I like very much. The causes of life are few, and the causes of death are many. If you ever have a chance to look at the ICD-10, which is a list of all of the diseases, see how thick it is. Number three, precious human life is as fragile as a bubble of water, even a little insect. Thank you. So the second aspiration is take up a spiritual path now. <laughs> Third root. At the time of one's death, only our spiritual achievements are of value. Three reasons. Friends, relatives, doctors cannot prevent death, nor can they go with us. Power, wealth, and fame are of no help. Even our cherished body is left behind like a pile of garbage. Last aspiration. Practice this path purely without regard for worldly concerns. This is... Uh, so we memorize this and we practice it. And we then visualize all the, so there are some additional practices that go along with this about the dissolution of the different parts of our body and the different elements of our body in eight parts. And then there is a visualization of a sequence of colors. This is to help us at the moment of death and then we practice visualizing all the different ways that we can die. We 
we end by doing the colors again in the reverse order. So in a moment, we're going to walk over to the Dizong Hall. And when we go to the Dizong Hall, then you'll be hearing the monastics leading everyone in the chanting in Chinese. And you might be wondering, well, what are they chanting? So they're probably, by this time, on to the 13th chapter, the last chapter. And uh, this is the text in English. At that time, the world-honored one raised his golden-hued arms and touching Bodhisattva Mahasattva Kitigarbha, Dizong's head, under the following words, O oh, Kitigarbha, O oh, Kitigarbha, your miraculous power is inconceivable. Your compassion is inconceivable. So is your wisdom. So is your eloquence. Let all the Buddhas from all quarters in the ten directions speak about and praise your inconceivable qualities, but they cannot exhaust the number of them even after a thousand of myriad of kalpas. Oh, Kitigarbha, oh, Kitigarbha, remember that today in Triam Trimsha Palace, amid the congregation of all the hundreds of myriads of millions of inexpressed both inexhaustible numbers of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas together with the eight categories of beings, including Devas and Nagas, I once again commend to you those sentient beings, such as human beings and Devas, who have not yet escaped from or transcended the three realms and are still caught up in the burning mansion. Do not let those sentient beings ever fall into the evil paths of existence, even for only one day or one night, much less let them commit five unpardonable sins and fall into a vika hell, just remaining there for thousands of myriads of millions of kalpas without a date of acquittal. Oh, Kitty Garbo, all the sentient beings in the southern John Buddha realm are unpredictable in their wills and dispositions. Most of them are accustomed to evil doing. Even if they decide to do good, they may retreat from their good intentions in an instant. Surrounded by evil environmental conditions, their evil wills increase and intensify moment by moment. For this reason, I transform myself into hundreds of thousands of millions of other forms to convert, deliver, release, and liberate them in accordance with their respective roots and dispositions, etc. And then the world honored one uttered the following data, a verse. The multitude of devas and human beings of the present and future, I now sincerely entrust you to deliver with your great and miraculous power and skillful means so they will never again fall into the evil paths of existence. This leads us to the very conclusion of the sutra, in which he says, Furthermore, Bodhisattva Akasangaba, in the present of the future, if any deva, naga, deities, or demons should hear Kitigarbha's name, worship Kitigarbha's image, or just hear about Kitigarbha's fundamental vows and deeds, if they should at that same time praise him and make obeisance to him, then they will gain the seven kinds of benefits, namely the rapid progress in the holy sacred stages of achievement, the illumination, and disappearance of all evil karma, the protection and attendant of the Buddha, the non-retrogression from the path of the Buddha, the great increase of one's own powers, the complete awareness and knowledge of one's previous lives, and the final achievement. So this is what we will be hearing in Chinese. So at the conclusion of this, we will stand, we will make three bows, and then we will walk in noble silence downstairs, and we will uh, put on our shoes and walk 
slowly over to the Dizong Hall and enter there. We don't need to take our shoes off inside the Dizong Hall. You may if you like, but not the required. May all beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings never be separated from the sacred joy which is free from suffering. And may all beings dwell in the great equanimity which is free from attachment, aversion, 